now we come to the story of Mephibosheth. Great name, isn't it? <laughs> Chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? All the way back in 1 Samuel 19. Jonathan had David swear a covenant not to kill him or his family when he became king, which would have been standard practice at the time. Jonathan said, let not the name of Jonathan be cut off from the house of David. David agrees. So David finds out from Ziba, Saul's former servant, that Jonathan has one son still living, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is lame in both feet from a childhood accident, and he lives way out in the boonies in a small nowhere town across the Jordan River away from the action. So, David sends for Mephibosheth, <clears throat> son of Jonathan, son of Saul, the next man in line in the house of Saul. Yes? Is that uh, Mirabal? Is that, is that the, another name for him? Um, Mithabal, yeah, Mithabal. he's got two names. I guess we're using different Bibles. Yeah, harder, harder yeah. Bibles. Okay. <laughs> okay, here's a tangent. Mirabal is what they have? Yeah. 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 Okay, that was probably his real name. There are several names here that end with Bosheth, which means of shame, because whoever was writing this, the prophets, could not bear to write that some of the Israelites were naming their children after the pagan god Baal. Oh. Oh. Mirabal is named after Baal. Who's the other one? Ishbosheth is Ishbal, Saul's son. Same name, but any name in the Old Testament that has a Baal at the end sometimes gets transliterated Bosheth instead. Because the prophets to uh, the prophets don't want to write Baal's name. Yeah. Learn something every day, huh? So Mephibosheth, next in line in the house of Saul, has been summoned to the court of David. What does Mephibosheth think is going to happen next? Absolutely. Sudden, instant death. Mephibosheth shows up in front of David and falls on his face. David says, do not be afraid. I will restore to you all of Saul's lands, and because of your father, Jonathan, you shall eat at my table always. <laughs> Mirabal is astounded. What is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? <laughs> and from that day forward, Mephibosheth moves into the palace and becomes a part of David's family. David kept his promise to Jonathan extravagantly. Mephibosheth expected death. David makes him part of the family. That's the kind of mercy God shows us. Unconditional love. We are sinners, subject to death. But God brings us into the family, his family. David's extravagant goodness to Mephibosheth only gets crazier during the rebellion of Absalom. I'm going to jump ahead a little here, like 20 years. In the rebellion of Absalom, David is forced to flee Jerusalem. People are defecting to Absalom left and right. Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, tells David, Mephibosheth has betrayed you. He's joined the rebellion. He hopes that he just might emerge as king at the end of the day. David struck to the heart. You know, here he is. He's been, he's been his father for 20 years. And so David, you know, gives Ziba all of Mephibosheth, gives Ziba all of Mephibosheth's land and starts mourning for Mephibosheth. But after the rebellion, David comes back to Jerusalem. And there's a mosquito on my nose. And Mephibosheth says to David, no, I didn't join the rebellion. Ziba sided with Absalom. I wanted to leave Jerusalem with you, but because of my bad feet, I couldn't, and Ziba would not take me with him. He lied so he could get my land. One of them is a liar and a traitor to the crown. Which one? So, which one's lying? Any idea? No, no, no. Ziba. <laughs> Honestly, I think the answer is probably Ziba, but the text does not make that clear. Why not? David doesn't care. David doesn't bother with an inquiry. 
he forgives them on the spot, splits Saul's land between them, and welcomes them both back to the family table. This is almost unbelievable mercy. And it's the same way God treats us. God loves us with the same extravagance. David made a covenant with Jonathan. And because God's made a covenant with us, he's never going to break it. He makes us his children. And even when we sin against him, when we come back to him, he welcomes us home with open arms. It's the way God treats us. How about us? Can we love the unloving? Can we show that same kind of incredible mercy that David showed to a traitor, not even knowing or bothering to find out which one was plotting against him, just inviting him back to the table? After David becomes king in Jerusalem, God continues to give him great success in battle. David builds a regional empire. It's a long list of conquered nations, Moab, Edom, the Amalekites, the Ammonites, and more. All these peoples are conquered by David. They all pay tribute to David's treasury. Many of them become slaves and servants in Israel. The list of victories goes on and on for about two chapters. Is unbroken success a good thing for us? I don't think so. Don't think so. You know, God was blessing Israel, but uh, I'm going to speculate that this unbroken success wasn't a good thing for David. Power corrupts. David, as we head into our next story, is going to start getting arrogant. As we head into David and Bathsheba, let's take out our uh, papers that show David's family tree on it, his wives and children, and take a moment to talk about polygamy. So at the time of the David and Bathsheba story, David's probably about 50 years old, more or less. We don't have a really good date stamp for that. He's got at least seven wives, probably more. He's got at least ten concubines, probably more. Let's give a little history. Why did ancient Near Eastern kings take multiple wives? Well, for love, for lust. A surprisingly large number of them are because of treaties. You make a peace treaty with a foreign land, you marry the daughter of the neighboring king. Lots of them come by treaty. You inherit them from the previous king. In chapter 12, if you read closely, God tells David, I gave you the wives and concubines of Saul, and this is how you repay me? David's got the wives and concubines of Saul, whoever they were. They get inherited. They're passed down from one king to the next. Another reason Near Eastern kings take multiple wives, sheer social status. The more wives you have, the richer you are, because you can afford to keep up all these women in a high-status kind of way. Good luck with that. <laughs> the wives, then, are seen as more, really more or less as honored property. Reading this, I'm afraid, it makes so much sense if the women are looked at as property of an especially honored kind. It's essentially a collection of Ferraris that also happen to produce heirs to the throne. <laughs> Much as a very rich person today might collect fast cars, a very rich person of that time collected wives, as a matter of course. What's the difference between wives and concubines? Wives are of higher social status. Again, treaty wives, inherited wives, and only the sons of the wives are considered possible heirs to the throne. Who are the concubines then? You're usually the household servants. Often they're the servants of the wives. Think all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. The servants of the wives become their concubines. These concubines are the people that take care of David, his wives, his children, take care of the house. In the ancient world, servants were generally considered the sexual property of their masters if the master happened to desire them. It's brutal. That's not of God, obviously. That's the society that we're dealing with, though. So what might the social interaction between David and his wives have looked like? Well, you're not going to get anything like the emotional vulnerability and intimacy that you get in a monogamous marriage. Not too long ago, I happened upon a documentary where a reporter interviewed a Central African tribal king and some of his 50 wives. Such arrangements do still exist today, though they're vanishingly rare. I was very interested in what the wives had to say about all this, and this is what they had to say. The wives expected to be taken care of for the rest of their lives with great comfort. 
suitable separate living quarters, servants, fine clothing, etc. The wives expect to have the ear of the husband, of the king, on important matters. They expect to be regarded with high honor by their community. This is a great social honor. The wives did not expect much in the way of friendship, intimacy, or time with the king. And jealousy and competition between the wives and the children was almost a given. What does God think about all this? We'll talk more about that next week with Solomon. But Deuteronomy 17.17 17 is very clear. The king must not multiply wives to himself, or his heart will be led astray. That brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. All right, let's stop there. The story opens with a zinger. In the time of year when kings go to war, David is taking a nap. <laughs> David stayed home. He's taking a nice afternoon nap on his nice soft couch on his nice rooftop veranda. He sent Joab to go do the fighting. What happened? The author strongly implies that David the warrior has become, as Bishop Barron puts it, David the lazy napper. <laughs> Somewhere along the way here, he's lost a sense of mission. He's tired. And he's also put his relationship with God on the back burner. Let us continue. I'm just going to summarize this, but you can, you can skim along if you like. So, David sent Joab off to war. Then David sent messengers to inquire after Bathsheba. Then he sent for Bathsheba. Then Bathsheba sent word to David that she was pregnant. So David sent for Joab, get me her husband, Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent Uriah to David. David sent Uriah home and told him to enjoy his wife, but he wouldn't. David sent once again for Uriah, got him good and drunk, and once again tried to send him home. No good. So David sent a letter to Joab, ordering the death of Uriah. Joab sent Uriah into the hardest fighting, got him killed, and sent word of his death to David. Then David sent for Bathsheba and brought her into his home. Okay. Does anyone notice an operative word to this story? <laughs> David sent. It's in every other sentence. David sent, David sent, David sent. Who is this sending David, lording it over everyone? Whatever happened to David the good shepherd, David who cares for the flock of Israel. Now, in any other Near Eastern kingdom 3,000 years ago, this behavior wouldn't be a blip on the radar screen. It would be completely expected. David, though, is supposed to be God's king, subject to the king of kings. And instead, David is playing God with other people's lives. We play up the lust when we retell the story, because that's the most obvious part of the story. But I gotta say, this is really a story about arrogance. David, in his arrogance, has committed adultery and murder. He's messing with people's lives, real people, for his own personal desire and personal convenience. How do we treat the people around us? Are there situations where we lord it over people? Are there situations where we treat people according to our personal convenience, instead of humbly caring for them and helping them to be the people God is calling them to be. So what is God's response to this situation? I gotta, you gotta love the irony here. Chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> and the Lord sent Nathan to David. <laughs> it's God's turn to do a little sending. The prophet Nathan tells a story guaranteed to touch David's soft heart, disguising it as an actual court case. The rich man with many flocks and herds steals a poor man's one pet sheep to feed a guest. David becomes angry. He blurts out, this man deserves to die. He shall, he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Nathan says to David, you are that man. Nathan tells David that his egregious sin is going to have egregious consequences. The sword shall never depart from David's house. 
as David resorted to using violence for personal ends, so shall his children. Some commentators note that David will pay fourfold for his crime, just like he judged himself. Four of his sons are going to die. His infant son with Bathsheba, as well as Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah. Nathan continues, The Lord will take your wives and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your own wives in the sight of the sun. David is going to have adultery committed against him. Furthermore, David committed sexual violence, so shall his children. The sword shall not depart from your house. How does David reply? Think back a, a couple of classes. How would Saul have replied? Ooh. Made excuses. <laughs> Made excuses. You were late, Nathan. Why didn't you stop me before, huh? Did you see what she was wearing? I tried. <laughs> I tried. Your eye doesn't know what's good for him. Yeah. Instead, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. <clears throat> Period. No excuses. No explanations. Nathan accepts David's confession. The Lord has forgiven your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, the child born to you shall die. God forgave David's sin. God restored David to a right relationship with himself, just like that. One sentence confession, blink of an eye. You're forgiven. You're saved. And yet, David's sin has real life consequences. His children are going to follow in his violent footsteps. Uh, I wrote here, someone in class brought up, if David's sins are forgiven, why does he have to suffer the consequences? I thought of an example. Forgiveness of sins does not mean erasing the consequences. Here's an everyday example. A couple of days ago, our foster son threw a basketball in the house and knocked over a dish of nuts. Broke the dish. Scattered the nuts. Did we forgive him? Of course. We love him. He's part of the family. Did he have to help clean up the mess? Of course. We love him. It's part of the family. Because it's his responsibility. And we, we want him to remember not to throw the basketball in the house. But our family relationship stays intact. So there's kind of a simple everyday example of sin, of how sin looks with forgiveness and consequences at the same time. This happens all the time. Yes. In 15 years from now, you're not going to beat the kid again, right? Huh? You're not going to punish him again in 15 years. Like, yeah, no. I'm not going to. I'm not going to bring the dish of nuts up again. gave David, did he? And he turns around and he punishes him for the next what, 20, 30 years? Yeah, but we're, not, we're talking murder, not cashews. <laughs> <laughs> Do I think David's punishment could have been lighter? Well, I'm not going to judge the big guy up there, but <laughs> I'm just saying personally, you know, oh, God forgave him, but then he made his four sons suffer horribly. And, I mean, that's a question. You know, so you could see, well, maybe David has to suffer the consequences of his sins, but his sons, what did they do? Yeah. And that's kind of a only God knows question. We're going to see that these sons that suffer, they're not nice people at all. Only God knows everything they did, but it's pretty obvious they're suffering for their own sin and not just the sin of David. But it's also obvious, just in our everyday lives, that when we sin, it affects our children. Mm -hmm. Birth parents, foster children, oh my goodness, I get to see this all the time. <laughs> On the one hand, it's a natural consequence. When we, when we don't follow God, yeah, it affects the people in our lives, it affects the people around us, it doesn't just affect us. But is God going to actively punish our children? No, that's not what God does. Think of uh, the blind man. Who sinned, him or his father? Right. Yeah. Jesus says, no, 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 it's not like that. And again, that's just something that, again, we can see in our own everyday lives. It's not that God is mean. It's not that God wants to punish David's children. It's just when you do this, you're setting an example for them to follow. Look at what's going to happen now. And God does use these consequences as discipline for us. We are God's children. God loves us. 
and he disciplines us. In David and Bathsheba, we see that sin has consequences, but grace is still at work. We see that powerfully in the case of David and Bathsheba. David's firstborn son with Bathsheba is going to die. And yet, God will bless the marriage of David and Bathsheba. God's going to continue his plan for the salvation of the world through David and Bathsheba with their child, Solomon. God works through our broken lives. God works through our mistakes, our messes, and our sinful situations. And no matter how badly we have screwed up in the past, God will continue to work through us, just like he continued to work through David. And it's true. There's hope for David. There's hope for all of us. It's so true. One thing David was especially good at, that we get to get good at too, is repenting. David's repentance was immortalized in Psalm 51. It should say at the top of the psalm, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. If it's been a while since you've looked through the psalms, uh, it's worth noticing that a lot of the psalms are labeled by author. A lot of them are written by Asaph, who we'll meet next week. Um, a lot of them are written by David. A lot of them even say under what circumstances David wrote them. It's pretty interesting to flip through and go, ooh, David wrote that when he was being chased by Saul. Ooh, David wrote that when he was betrayed. That kind of thing. <coughs> We're probably all familiar with this psalm if we start skimming it. Again, it shows up often at Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours. The part I grew up singing in the Lutheran Liturgy every Sunday starts in verse 10. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Anyway, I grew up as a child with that verse ringing through my head. I heard it most Sundays of my life. <laughs> David doesn't, and even now, every time I need to say sorry for a sin, creating me, I go right back to that. <laughs> David doesn't merely ask for pardon. David goes much further. He asks for a pure heart. He asks for God's presence to come back. He asks for God's Holy Spirit to fill him anew. He asks for joy, restore to me the joy of your salvation. His prayer is answered. He's confident that this prayer is going to be answered, that he's going to receive not just checkbox forgiveness, but real forgiveness, full forgiveness, restoration to full fellowship with God. One commentary I read said that we should become sin watchers like some people are bird watchers. We should go looking for sin in our own lives, not with dread, but with a certain sense of anticipation and delight. Ooh, what sin are we going to discover today? Because each time we discover a sin and own up to it in our lives, it's a chance for us to experience God's grace. A chance for us to go, wow, I screwed up. Thank you that you love me anyway. When we confess our sin, we get that promise of forgiveness and openness to healing and new life. Our natural inclination is to hide from God when we sin, like Adam and Eve. I can think of years pre-conversion that without even knowing it, I pretty much spent hiding from God because I knew I wasn't in a really good place with him. Instead, God encourages us to be honest. Bring it all out in the open. Show your wound to the heavenly doctor so he can heal it. Don't bother trying to hide it from the world either. Be real with God, with others, with yourself. A sense of sin then is an invitation to experience God's forgiveness, closeness, 